Madam Curry Baines, I'm the president of Regular Intercellite Corporation, or AMSAT. One of our colleagues, Jan King, W3GEY, wrote an obituary about Jan that I think does an excellent job of describing the greatness that Dick put into AMSAT. It might take us a few moments to read some excerpts. Dick achieved so much working for AMSAT that it's virtually impossible to enumerate his individual accomplishments. And we cannot overestimate the importance of his sustained support. Dick was many things to us, but among them he was our record keeper, photographic recorder, and a de facto AMSAT historian. So his loss also presents the loss of many memories of the things we did and the places we've gone as an organization, which simply can't be recorded or kept except in our minds. So our loss is huge. The records of the earliest spacecraft developments, starting with Australia's Oscar V and continuing to present, amount to over 6,000 individual, non duplicate 35 millimeter slides. These have since been digitized. They were all kept and maintained by Dick. Many of the photographs were his own. Dick was one of the initial AMSAT members in 1969 and was lifted at number 11. His first major contribution to amateur radio was his work to obtain permission from the NASA administrator, then James Fletcher, and the NOAA administrator, then Janet Townsend, the launch of Australia's Oscar V. It was Dick who pushed our AMSAT letter proposal for the launch of AO5 from NASA and NOAA systems. Dick was also heavily involved in our efforts to license AO5 with the Federal Communications Commission. That was a much bigger deal back in 1970 than it is today. You will appreciate the resistance we had within the system from the Tyler's Project Office at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and what had to be done to overcome it. You will also remember the support we had from places we didn't expect. But with Dick's help and all of us pushing, we were in business. The business of building satellites for free. Dick became Antonetti's primary mechanical designer and technician, having helped design and then assemble just about every spacecraft structure we had launched, starting with AMSA Oscar VI. At the beginning of the Phase Three era, it became clear that AMSA needed to go into the propulsion business if we were going to get to higher orbits, and Dick took on the role of chief propulsion expert in addition to his mechanical and technician duties. Dick and I installed the Thiopol solid propellant kick motor into the ill-fated Phase 3A satellite once it arrived in French Guiana, and it was Dick working with MBB who loaded the bipropellant fuels on board AO-10, AO-13, and AO-40, all very dangerous compounds. Even though the rocket motor each time was pure German technology, Dick was the one we all trusted to handle exacting tasks of propellant loading. He also developed, assembled, and tested all the propellant flow assembly units that control the fuel and pressurization of each of the propulsion systems. He also contributed significantly to the design details. The utilization of real, high-performance propulsion systems on small satellites is still something no other small satellite organization other than AMSAT has successfully achieved. Few have even attempted to follow our footsteps. We've had our difficulties with rocket motors, and one organization has tried to use them has not, but at least AO-13 was perfect. No professional organization has ever done much better than the performance of that propulsion system, and in large measure, the success of that system can be credited to Dick Daniels. The other P-3 satellites at least had partially successful motor firing except for P-3A, which was lost to a launch vehicle failure, hence we never had a chance to fire our solid rocket. Dick also <coughs> spent time working on the gantry level of many launch vehicles, installing AMSAT spacecraft and Delta Ariane launchers, and as NASA HQ employee, he built more spaceflight hardware in his basement than anyone working for NASA in Washington, D.C. ever saw in their lifetime. He loved life and he made his count. He made a huge difference to our hobby, the outcome of our hobby, and our belief in what an angel can do in space. I have my own personal comment. As a new board member for AMSAT in 1999, I went up to San Diego for a board meeting. And in those days, the AMSAT board meetings were known to be, let's call it, tested. And it, not surprisingly, that meeting turned out to be a little bit tested. But as a new board member, I was determined to remain silent. I wanted to watch, I wanted to learn, I wanted to figure out how this organization worked at home. As a board member, and I was sitting across from Dick. And through all that testiness, Dick pretty much remained quiet. He sort of observed what was going on and probably smiled within his own self and let the folks that were being tested be tested. 
tested. The thing I noted that when Dick did speak, people listened. People who were tested were no longer tested. They listened to Dick. I think that's a reflection of the impact that Dick had at AMSAC, and to amateur radio. And that is partially documented in a book that was published in 2009, celebrating our fourth anniversary. Um, during the reception, I encourage you to take a look at that book that's out there. It gives an excellent overview of our organization and describes very well the significant impact that Dick had on our organization. Dick was a giant. And perhaps it's by coincidence, but I take it as good fortune that on February 14th, when we lost Dick, it was also the same day that NASA announced that AMSAT's Fox 1 project has been accepted for the Alana project. And we will continue in space, keeping amateur radio in space, continuing the legacy that Dick helped us have.